myself They're running of colors To paint the whole picture There aren't enough words to ever say what I found Wonderful and beautiful and glorious and holy He is merciful and powerful Who are we talking about? That's my thing We declare the glory Give Him all the honor All together worthy Who are we talking about? That's my thing There's no one before you Yes, we will adore you Somebody might want to get ready in the house today because your miracle is on the way. Another one is 
the miracle workers in the house right now. He's alive. He's risen. Can anybody celebrate with me today? Come on, we serve a risen Savior. We serve a risen Savior. He's not dead. He's not buried, but he's alive. And he's in this place right now. So as our prayer partners make their way down to the front, we know there are many needs in this house. If you need healing for your body, if you need healing for your mind, healing for your spirit, healing for your family, healing for your finances, anything that you have need of right now, if you'll come down and allow us to pray with you, it's our privilege and honor to be able to pray with you and lift these needs up before the Lord with you. and Believe God for a miracle to take place in your life today. If you're just looking for a relationship with Jesus Christ for the very first time, come down and let us pray with you and lead you to the foot of the cross because we do serve a risen Savior. I'm so thankful for that. Come on, let's celebrate that right now. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody say this. And if he told the sun when to rise and it did, he will again. And if he told the storm to be still and he did, and if he told the sea where to split, and it did, he will again. And if he told those walls when to fall, and they did, he will again. And if he told the chains when to break, and they did, he will again. And if he told the bones come alive, and they did, he will again.
some praise. Come on, let's lift up the name that is above every other name. That at the mention of the name of Jesus, everything has got to change. Give him some praise. Come on, I don't know what you know about the name Jesus. I don't know if for you, you think of Jesus and you think of a historical character. I don't know if you think of Jesus and you think of a picture on a wall or a little figurine, but I'm here to tell you that some of us have had an encounter with Jesus. And when we think of the name of Jesus, we can't help but think about the healings that have happened in our life. When we think about the name of Jesus, we can't help but think about the peace that's come over our minds. When we think about the name of Jesus, we can't help but think about who we used to be and that God has set us free. And so I'm believing for someone in this room today. The name of Jesus won't just be a picture on a wall anymore, but it'll be a person who you're in an intimate, real relationship with. And so Jesus, we acknowledge you right now, God. We love you, Jesus. This day is all about you. You are the risen King. You are the reason why we're here. You're the reason why we're breathing, God. We give you all the praise and we give you all the honor. Fill our hearts with gratitude this morning. In your name we pray. Amen, amen. If you're grateful for Jesus, come on, put your hands together this morning. Come on. Happy Easter, happy Easter. Come on. Praise God. Man, I'm excited. I'm excited because Jesus is in the room this morning. Hey, as you're being seated, lean over to your neighbor with zeal and passion and say, Happy Easter. Now turn over to your other neighbor who you didn't think about and say, Hey, Happy Easter to you too. <laughs> Good. I'm so glad you're here. Hey, for all of our people who are in the overflow room right now, thank you, thank you, thank you for being here. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us in our family this morning. And for all of our first time guests, welcome. Hey, can we give it up for all of our first time guests? We are so glad you're here. We're so glad you're here. And here at Christian Life Austin, we are a family, and we would love for you to be a part of our family. We would love for you to get connected with us. And there's a couple of easy ways that you can do that this morning. There's a connection card right in front of you in the seat back. Pull it out, fill it out completely, and return it to our welcome center in the lobby. We'd love to get connected with you. Or you can text the word welcome to the number 512-456-3748. However you decide to do it. We'd love to get connected with you. Hey, right now what we're going to do is we're going to continue in this time of worship. We are going to enter into a time where we get to give, where we get to be generous with our tithe and with our offering. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, there's a couple of easy ways that you can do that here. You can give in our giving stations located at the back of the room. You can give online or you can give right here in person as our ushers are making their way forward. Let me pray over our gift. Let's, let me pray over our tithe. Let me pray over your finances. God, right now, you're the owner of it all. <laughs> you own every dime. You own every dollar. You own every job. And so, God, we are grateful that you're such a giving God. And so, Father, I pray that we too would be just like you. We would be generous just as you are generous. God, I'm praying for financial blessing over families out there right now who are struggling. I'm praying over jobs, God, that people are missing jobs right now. Father, I'm just praying for financial peace and blessings over them as well. Lord, we love you. We give with a joyful heart. In your name we pray. Amen, amen, and amen. Well, you're here at our second service of the day, but I want to make sure that you know that year-round, every week, we are here worshiping together. And so if you're looking for a family, if you're looking for a place to worship Jesus on a weekly basis, we have so many opportunities throughout our week. Every Sunday, we have three service times, 8.30 a.m., 10.15 a.m., and then 12.15 p.m. And so we would love for you to come back and join us next Sunday if you don't have a place to worship on Sunday. And then on Tuesdays, for all my young adults in the house, come on now. There we go. There we go. They're excited. 
I'm the young adult pastor here with my wife, and we get to meet every single Tuesday at 7.30 p.m. We'd love for you to come and join us on Tuesdays as well. And then on Wednesdays, we have a midweek service at 7.30, and we have an opportunity for our kids and for our students, for our youth, for middle school and high school to be able to meet as well. And so we have so many opportunities to be connected here throughout the week. If you don't have a place to connect throughout the week, please come hang out with us this week. Well, I love you. Are you ready for the message today? Praise God. We'll turn your attentions to the screens for the video announcements. Welcome to Christian Life Austin, a church that exists to love you where you are and move to where God wants you to be. We do this by helping you know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference in the lives of others. Have you ever wondered how you can get connected serving at Christian Life Austin? If you're interested in being a part of our dream team, helping on our next gen team, production team, parking lot team, and so much more, check out Growth Track, our next steps class that happens every Sunday during second service. Make a plan to join us for Growth Track to get plugged into CLA, start serving on a team, and get better connected with your church family today. Christian Life Austin family, we have an exciting new way that you can give back to CLA Next Generation Ministries. Christian Life students holds three annual events throughout the year for our teens. Reveal Conference in the spring, Collide Camp in the summer, and Rise Conference in the fall. Our new initiative to sponsor students who need financial support attending these events is fundraising with Christian Life Austin merchandise. On Sunday, April 7th, we will have brand new CLA merch available for purchase after each service in the lobby, and all proceeds will go to sponsoring teens throughout the year. Our Next Gen Ministries, thank you for support, and we can't wait to see you rocking the new CLA merch. We have our midweek service every Wednesday at 7.30 p.m. Midweek also offers our Christian Life Kids and Christian Life Student Services. And this allows a time for you and your family to connect with Jesus on more than just a Sunday. Make sure to join us on Wednesdays at 7.30 p.m. for powerful worship and an impactful word. Parents of zero to 11 year olds, we wanna extend a warm welcome from Christian Life Kids. Make sure to check out all that we have going on for your little ones by stopping by our kids check-in through the glass double doors in the back of the lobby. For more details or to pre-register your child, head to christianlifeaustin.com forward slash kids. You can also keep up with curriculum, events, and your CLK community by following us on Instagram at christian.life.kids. If you're a young adult between the ages 18 and 35, join us for Christian Life Young Adult service that takes place on Tuesdays at 7.30 p.m. right here on campus. Christian Life Young Adults exists to serve and love our college students, young adults, and young professionals. If you're looking for a community of believers to plug into, check out CLYA. For more information, follow us on Instagram at ChristianLifeYA. Well, that's all we have for you. Please turn your attention back to center stage for today's message. Come on, happy Resurrection Sunday! Hey, is anybody happy to be in church on Easter Sunday morning? All right. Now, some of y'all got your your Easter finest outfit on. Some of you had to you had to watch a YouTube video to figure out how to tie a tie again. But here's what I need you to do. I need if you if you're feeling a little stiff in your chair, I need you to just kind of loosen up a little bit. Just kind of shake it out. Nobody's doing that. Just shake it out. Y'all, y'all left me up here by myself. Here's the thing I love about this house is that you have not walked into a dead, dry church. You have walked into a church that's full of the spirit, that is excited about what God is doing in the lives of people. And we're so glad you're here today. What a joy it is to see you in the house of the Lord on Easter Sunday. And we never take it for granted. We, we understand um, just we, we have the privilege of living in a pretty amazing city where there's so much to do, keep you busy all the time. I get that. Born and raised here, lived here my whole life. But with that comes distractions too. And if we're not careful, we can replace the best things for good things. And so with a city like Austin, it's really easy to find yourself really busy on a Sunday morning and neglect 
your spiritual life by coming to the house of the Lord and joining together. And so we understand that. And I just, I want to commend all of you today. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning, not just a Sunday morning, on Resurrection Sunday. And for those of you that I don't know, my name is Brad, my wife is Cassidy, and together we have the privilege of, of being the pastors of this church. And what a joy it is. Um, to have the calling from the Lord to lead such an amazing place. And I'm excited about the word of the Lord today. And before I, I dive in, Pastor Johnson has a dear friend in the house today that I, I want to acknowledge. He is a retired pastor, uh, Pastor Treadway. I don't know where you're sitting, sir, but we honor you. Thank you for your years of service to the kingdom. Thank you for being in... Austin for Easter Sunday. It's a joy to have you. But what a significant week we have been living as Christians. If you're a follower of Jesus, this has been a very, very significant week, the Holy Week. It's a powerful and important week in the lives of those that follow Jesus. And so much happened during this Holy Week in the life of Jesus and I, I understand on a Sunday like this, there's going to be so many of us at different places on our spiritual journey. There's going to be those of you that are here every Sunday. Every time the doors are open, you're here again today. But then there's others of you in the room who maybe a friend invited you, and this is your first time in church in a really, really long time. And so what I don't want to do is kind of you know, jump in on a, the middle of a movie and have you play catch up. Like, where, where am I? I'm a lost. I don't even know what you're talking about. So let me briefly kind of catch you up on what the Holy Week would have looked like so you, you too can understand the importance of where we are today and what we're doing on this Easter Sunday. Last Sunday was Palm Sunday where Jesus would have entered Jerusalem on a donkey while crowds of people welcomed him, waving palm branches, shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest, a day of celebration, fulfilling a Jewish prophecy. In the dramatic entry of Jesus riding a donkey in, you, you can begin to see the crowds following Jesus, and with that, Tensions between Jesus and the Jewish leaders began to mount, and Monday would come. What happens on Monday? Jesus would curse a fig tree for not bearing fruit, and then he goes to visit the main temple. And I love Jesus. You never know what Jesus, you, when you think you've got Jesus figured out, he says, not so fast, my friends. And this is, Jesus walks into the temple, and he sees a lot of corrupt people, and he starts flipping tables over. Y'all didn't see Jesus like that, did you? Y'all see Jesus walking all with a smile on his face, nice trim. No, Jesus, he was frustrated, and he said, you've turned my temple into a den of thieves. This is going to be a house of prayer. And so he kind of, he shows them who's boss and what's going on, and he, he lays the law down and and as Tuesday arrived, a new day would dawn, and the religious leaders would feel increasingly threatened by the way that the mass crowds are starting to respect the spiritual authority that Jesus has. Jesus would also leave the city and go to a place called the Mount of Olives, and he delivers a prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem and the end of the age. But then Wednesday, Wednesday would would show up and we would see Judas Iscariot. One of the disciples negotiated with the Jewish leaders a price and a plan to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver for a life. But when it's all said and done, it wouldn't be the life of Jesus. It would be Judas' own life. It's a quick reminder for those of us that are around Jesus, consider us a follower of Jesus. It's a solemn reminder that, that you can be around Jesus and still not have your heart transformed by him. I'm glad you're here today, but how's your heart? I'm glad we're, we're around Jesus, but how, how's your heart? Have you allowed him to transform your heart? 
On Thursday, tensions would continue to rise between Jesus and the religious leaders. Jesus and his disciples prepare to share in the Passover meal, celebrating God bringing them out of Egypt. And after this dinner, Jesus begins to wash the feet of his disciples, an act of selflessness, foreshadowing of what would take place on Friday. And then Jesus would would begin to change the conversation while they're having their Passover meal, he, he begins talking to his disciples about the fact that he's going to suffer, and they can't really wrap their minds around what he's talking about, and, and he sets communion up here. So for those of you that are here, when we, we partake of communion, this is where we get this from. After the meal, they go to a garden called Gethsemane, where the disciple that we've already talked about, Judas, betrays. Jesus and officially hands him over to the Jewish leaders and he's arrested and he's taken to the high priest for trial. And then Friday, Friday, Friday morning, Jesus went to trial for the accusations from the Jews. And we're all very aware, no matter where you stand or how how long you've been in church or if this is your very first, I think we all know how that trial ended up. Jesus was given a crown of thorns, beaten within an inch of his life, made to carry a massive cross through the city and up a hill called Calvary, where he would be nailed to that cross alongside two criminals. And at the ninth hour on Friday, Jesus, our Jesus, breathed his final breath. Which brings us to our text today, John Chapter 19, starting with verse 40. So Jesus has breathed his last breath. And taking Jesus' body, the scripture says, the two of them, Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, they wrapped it with spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance to the Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. And if you've been with us in church recently, you will know this, but if not, again, let me play catch up for those of you that may be joining us for the first time in a while. Over the last several weeks, we've been in a series that I've just been calling In the Room. And we've been exploring some rooms that Jesus was in. But not not just that. We've been looking at what happens when Jesus is actually in that room. In the first week of our series, we found Jesus in the dining room of Simon the Pharisee. The Bible says an immoral An unclean woman with an alabaster jar filled with very rare and expensive perfume falls on the ground at his feet. Picture this. Falls on the ground at his feet and she was weeping as he entered the room and the tears that were once hitting the floor are now hitting the feet of Jesus as she breaks the seal of her alabaster jar and begins to to pour this expensive, rare perfume on his feet with her tears hitting his feet and the perfume. And now she takes her hair and she begins to dry his feet with her hair. She was a sinner, no doubt. A woman who in that day and age, people would have known her by her sin, not by her name. And as we learned about Jesus in the room, we we discovered last Sunday that when Jesus is in the room, broken things that appear as if they have no hope. Jesus can take the most broken of people and put them back together in such a way. When Jesus is in the room, people that society would look at and walk right past without even acknowledging, people that don't feel known and people that don't feel seen, people that have felt overlooked their entire, when Jesus is in the room, He sees you, he knows you, he cares about you enough to put the broken pieces of your life back together. And today we, on this Easter Sunday, today we explore another room where we find Jesus. And that room is the tomb. And in the room of the tomb, 
Jesus teaches us so much without ever saying a word. He didn't have to say a word as he gave us the greatest gift that has ever been given. In the room of the tomb, Jesus teaches us so much. But let's read one more time how all of this played out to make sure that we're all on the same page because it's Friday. Jesus is dead. Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus have wrapped the body of Jesus in grave clothes and they've, they've put spices in the linens of uh, the strips of linen around his body to prepare him for burial. It's Friday. Jesus is dead and Jesus is in the tomb. But our text would lead us to Sunday. John Chapter 20, verse 1. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb. Now, can you imagine expecting to show up to the tomb of somebody that you loved, that you were there the whole journey with? You had been grieving and mourning all night, but you, you care so much about, you can't, you can't even sleep, and so you just wake up before it's even bright outside, and you make your way to a tomb. Come on, I'm scared of the dark. <laughs> she makes her way in the dark to a tomb, and she shows up to a tomb that should have the stone covering the entrance of the tomb. But when she gets close enough to see, she takes off running. And she goes, and she finds Peter. And the other disciple, the one that Jesus loved, <laughs> they've taken the Lord. They've taken him out of the tomb and they put him somewhere and we don't know where they put him. And you can imagine the, the hysteria that those closest to Jesus are feeling in this moment. They don't know what's going on. They're frustrated. They're, the whole gamut of emotions are running through their mind and their heart. And so Peter and the other disciples... Of course, hearing the news that Jesus' body is not in the tomb... They take off. Ah, they're running as fast as they can toward the tomb. And this, the Bible is funny, y'all. If you can't read the Bible and laugh, like this, I got so tickled as I was studying this over the last several weeks. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Y'all, Peter, he'd been at the buffet too much. <laughs> Peter needs to do some more burpees. He, he's got, Peter was out of shape. And so the other disciple shows up to the tomb first, and he gets over, and he, he kind of bends over, and he looks in, and he sees, what does he see? This is important. We'll talk about this in a little bit, but he sees the strips of linen when he got there, but he didn't go in. He may have got there fast, but he's scared of the dark. I'm not going in a dark, empty tomb. Nope. I don't know what's happening. But then Peter comes along behind him, and Peter may have been slow, but he wasn't scared. And he runs straight into the tomb, and he also sees the strips of linen lying there, as well as a cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in the place separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple. Now, he got there first, but he was too scared. But now Peter, who was slow, finally showed up, and he went in. Now the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside, and he saw, and he believed. On this Resurrection Sunday, I, I want to share with you just a few things, if you'll allow me over the next 20 minutes or so, just, just a few things that, I, that I've noticed about the room of the tomb. Some observations that when Jesus is in the room of the tomb, how it changes everything for you and for me. And the first observation, the first thing that I, I begin to think about is this concept of of how something is starting versus how it's currently going. Like how something starts versus how it's, it's actually going. And so Friday, remember, started with a smile on the face of our spiritual enemy. With Friday came death, and with Friday came grave clothes, and with 
Friday came a tomb, but aren't you grateful that how it started on Friday isn't how it finished on Sunday? When Jesus is in the room, how it starts isn't how it always finishes. See, when Jesus is in the room, things can change for you in an instant, but here's what I know about your adversary is that our spiritual adversary will try to convince you that how it started for you is how it's always gonna go for you. That since your life started in defeat, you will always be defeated. That since you grew up fatherless, you yourself will be a terrible father. That since you started under in life, you will never get over whatever it is that you're walking through. Since you started your 50s as an addict, you will end your 50s as an addict. And Jesus, through the room of the tomb on this Easter Sunday morning, steps back and he looks at each of us in the eyes and he's telling us that when I'm in the room, I don't care how it started for you. When you let me get in that room with you, how it started doesn't have to be how it finishes. I know it didn't look good yesterday. I know last year was a year that you don't want to relive. But can I tell you when I'm in the room? How it starts doesn't have to be how it finishes. Think about it for just a moment. Jesus is a prime example. He went from detested to arrested to persecuted and then resurrected. How it started on Friday is not how it ended on Sunday. And if it happened for him, you don't think he will do it for you? He's done too much for me to believe any otherwise. As we read and and, and just have read our text a moment ago, there's one character in this text on that morning that showed up to the tomb that has intrigued me, and it is the woman by the name of Mary Magdalene. She woke up early in the morning. In fact, I'd be surprised if she slept much at all because Jesus had done so much for her throughout the course of her life. If you study her life, he had done so much for her. And she wakes up early and she decides to go down to the tomb to be loyal to a Jesus who is dead. Now watch. It's really easy to be loyal to a Jesus when he's unstopping deaf ears and he's opening blind eyes. It's real easy to be loyal to a Jesus who you're starting to get a little credit and fame for because you're in his circle and he's doing all. It's easy to be loyal to a Jesus who is making ways for people and raising people up from the dead and feeding 5,000, but it's a whole different thing to be loyal to a Jesus who now everybody thought was dead, including herself. And this is where she finds herself. She is loyal to, because, I don't know if there's anybody in the room on Easter Sunday who knows that Jesus has done so much for you that it doesn't matter what state he finds himself in, that he's already done enough for me, that if he doesn't do another thing for me, I'm gonna be loyal to him. And so here's what Mary Magdalene understood on that morning, and I think the second thing that I want to share with you today that I think is so vital and important, and it's this, it's something that you would have heard before without question, but sometimes it's the smallest things and the things that we know that we tend to forget, and it's this, that when Jesus is in the room, it's always too soon to give up. When when Jesus is in the room, it's always too soon to give up, to everyone involved, to those following him, to those around him, to those closest to him, to those even in his inner circle, it appeared as if there was no more time on the clock. It it appeared as if the final seconds had run out in the game and there were no more moves for the king to make. If he were gonna save himself, he would have had to do it before he breathed his last breath on Friday, but now he's dead. Now it's too late, but when 
Jesus is in the room. He takes a situation. Come on, uh, listen, I know it's Easter Sunday, and I know we're all buttoned up and tightened up, but I wonder if there's anybody on an Easter Sunday who has ever seen Jesus walk into the room of your situation that you were hopeless and you were bound up, that nobody gave you hope, you didn't even give yourself hope, and he said, don't quit, don't give up, because when I arrive on the scene, it's always too soon to give up. I know on paper it looks like it's over. I know the report looks so bad that you have absolutely no hope. I know, I know that it's so bad that you can't sleep at night, that you're crying yourself to sleep at night, that your mind is racing night after night after night. And I've come to encourage you on an Easter Sunday morning that when Jesus is in the room, today's not the day to quit. Today's not the day. To, here's, what I know, here's what I know about some of us, and this is not prophetic. This is just the nature of a room this size. There's some of you who have a God-given dream, a calling, a relationship, a promise from God. And you know what you've done with that promise, with that relationship, with that dream, with that company? You did just what Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus did to Jesus. You've taken that dream, you've taken that relationship, you've taken that promise from God, and you've wrapped it with strips of linen, and you've prepared that baby for burial. Because it didn't happen when you thought it was going to happen. And you thought because it didn't happen in your timing that the clock had expired on the thing that you thought you heard from God. And so you said, listen, if I don't have to see it, then I won't think about it. And so you've wrapped it in grave clothes. And you've put spices in the grave clothes. And you've put it in a tomb. And you've rolled a stone over it. And you've given up on what God has given you. Because you can't see it, you can only hear it. And because you can't see it, you placed it in a tomb. And you said, listen, there's no way that God can do it now. The timing is over. I'm past my prime. I don't, I don't have what it takes anymore. Jesus is telling us on this Easter Sunday morning through the room of the tomb that when he's in the room, don't give up on that dream. Don't you give up on that promise. That child will come home. That child will come back to faith. That daddy that you've been praying for, he will turn his heart back over to the Lord. That mama that you've been praying for, things will change. Addictions and change will fall. Don't you give up. It's too soon to quit when Jesus is in the room. Someone once said that the tomb of Christ is the only tomb in history that is famous for what it does not contain. I'll show you the final thing that I saw about Jesus in the room of the tomb. And then I'll let you beat all the other churches to brunch. Here it is. When Jesus is in the room, you too can come out of the tomb. Now see, that doesn't, let me tell you who that should fire up. Those of you that have been in darkness, but now you're in his marvelous light. Now let me tell you who that, who that shouldn't fire up yet. Those of you that are still walking in darkness, so to speak, and I'm gonna explain that in just a moment. You shouldn't get excited about that yet, and let me tell you why. Because you don't know how good the light is. But when Jesus is in the room, you too, my friend, can come out of that tomb. You too can, can go from spiritually dead to fully alive. 
You too can go from being wrapped in grave clothes to walking in freedom, to walking in newness. When Jesus is in the room, he's not the only one that can come out of that tomb. He is looking for somebody who's saying, listen, I'm ready for something different. I've been in here far too long. I'm tired of my circumstances. I'm tired of the way that I've been living my, I'm ready for something new. And on your own, friends, you don't have the strength. I know, I know you work out, sun's out, gun's out, it's that time of year. But on your own, you don't have the strength to move the stone. We have the strength to find ourselves in that cycle time and time again, trying something only to understand that it's not what we were looking for. We're happy for a moment, but three days later, two days later, 30 minutes later, we're looking for more joy because what we just tried isn't the joy that we've been looking. It's not really filling what we've been searching for. Pastor Brad, you don't know my life. You're right, I don't. Pastor Brad, you don't know what I've done. You don't know the seriousness of my sin. You don't know the massiveness of the mistakes that I've made, and you're right. My li I feel like I'm trapped with no way out. I feel like I'm, I'm in this dark stage of life, in this dark place where there's no sunlight, it's gloomy all the time in my world. I'm trapped with no way out in a dark place that's starting to stink. And I may not know where you are, but can I tell you, as the Lord hears your hearts today, he's saying, I resonate with where you are. The place that you find yourself right now sounds an awful, light, awful lot like a tomb that I found myself in dark, trapped with everybody looking on thinking there's, there's no way out of this. You're in a situation now, it's too late for you. Now a few days have set in, <laughs> things starting to stink. <laughs> I may not know the situation that you find yourself in, but can I tell you, the tomb sounds an awful lot like the situation that you find yourself in right now. Trapped in your sin, in the depths of despair, with the stench from Friday night on your clothes. Can I tell you that no matter how bad your life has been, no matter how bad you've been in your life. The stink has never stopped him. <laughs> that the mess that you've made has never pushed him away. In fact, the mess has drawn him closer to you. He can bring you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You too can come out of the tomb. And here's the beauty of it. When he does it, did you notice what everybody saw, the three characters in our story today, Mary Magdalene and the two disciples, what they saw when they went into the tomb? They saw the grave clothes. They saw the residue of death. When Jesus takes you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, he will not do just a half job. He won't just wake you up and say, good game, son, go on. He won't just, he won't just resurrect you only to just maybe make it through life. But when Jesus is in the room and he brings you out of darkness and puts you into his marvelous light, you will have no residue of the grave clothes that you used to be wearing. The things, the things that used to bind you, 
the things that held you captive for so long, the things that started to stink. When Jesus is in the room and he brings you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, there will be no residue of your past. Can I tell you how powerful the blood of Jesus is? There will be no sin that is too big that his blood cannot cover. When Jesus does a job, he takes care, full care of that. When Jesus is in the room, would you stand with me all across the room today? telling you, if you will give Jesus a chance on this Easter Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, that when you come out of the tomb, there will not be residue of your past. Let me, let me show you how I know this. Because Jesus may have been betrayed by Judas in the garden, but he didn't stay there. Jesus may have been denied by Peter in the courtyard, but he didn't stay there. Jesus may have been brutally beaten at a whipping post, but he didn't stay there. Jesus may have been nailed to a cross on Friday, but he didn't stay there. Jesus may have been buried in a tomb, but he didn't stay there. The story of Jesus didn't end at the cross, and it didn't end in a tomb. And my friend... On this Easter Sunday, your story doesn't have to end there either. There's more to life than what you've been living. And I offer you Jesus today. And I would be remiss on Resurrection Sunday if I didn't, if I didn't give somebody the opportunity who wanted to know Jesus that opportunity today. I want to invite my wife, Cassidy, will you join me? And we want to pray for you today. That he would do something for you that you can't do for yourself. Something that you've been trying to do for yourself for far too long. But today, the grave clothes are coming off. Today, darkness is no more in your life. Today, you walk in light like you've never walked in light before. You thought... Life was good, but can I tell you post-Jesus, when you get Jesus in your life, what you thought was good doesn't compare to a life following and trusting Jesus. And I'll ask you this, what do you have to lose? You've tried everything else. Just try Jesus and see what happens. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're in the room today, you would say, you know what, Pastor? The word of the Lord talked to my heart today. And I'm ready. I'm ready to step out of darkness and walk into his marvelous light. I'm ready for my life to be different. I'm ready, maybe for the first time ever, to give my heart to Jesus and say, listen, from this day forward, Lord, I trust you. If that's you, would you just slip your hand in the air right now just so I know who we're praying for today. Wow. I see your hand, but more importantly, the Lord knows it. the hands that are represented in this room today. And listen, as I pray, you don't have to repeat after me, okay? You can say something like I say, but let it come from your heart. You know how you're feeling right now. The Lord is working on your heart right now. But it's something like this, Lord. What an honor it is today to feel your presence. Before today, I wouldn't have even known what it is that I'm feeling right now, but I acknowledge I feel something that I've never felt before. And Lord, you know better than me that I've been living my life my own way. I've been trying to do things by my own strength and according to my own will, but today, I'm ready for something to change. And to my friends and to my family, I know it looks like it's too late. It looks like 
There is no time left on the clock for you to move. But Lord, your word has showed me that it's too soon to quit when you're in the room. So today I'm going to give you a try. If you're real, if you really are who that pastor said that you are, would you save my soul today? Would you change my heart today? Would you bring me out of the darkness that I've been in, the trapped situation of my life, the stinky situation, and would you bring me into your marvelous life? Would you give me joy that I've been looking for everywhere else but haven't found it? Would you give me peace? And I know you will, Lord. So I surrender my heart to you right now. And I trust you as the Lord of my life. And I say, wherever you lead me, I will follow. I'm yours. And I thank you. I thank you for what you're going to do in my life. For it's in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said a good amen. Come on, can you put your hands together for the Lord today? Come on, can you celebrate all of those that just took that step of faith? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, we're so glad that you are here today on Easter Sunday before you leave. Why don't you high five somebody and tell them he's in the room. God bless you. Have a great rest of your weekend. We'll see you right back in the house on Wednesday night.